Okay, well, I'd like to get started. Thank you all very much for coming out on a snowy day in Washington, D.C. It's nice that our topic is related to the polar regions as we bring that region here, just for some evidence that, in fact, there are winters and it does get cold. And it's amazing to see what less than an inch and a little bit of ice can do to a modern American city. <laughs> so thank you all for coming out here today at the Wilson Center, and thank you all for joining <coughs> us online. We have colleagues and friends online throughout the country, the West Coast, Alaska, and across the, across the Atlantic, so I want to thank all of them for joining us today. I also want to thank uh, the President, CEO, and Director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Honorable Jane Harmon, who is in the back, who is running from meeting to meeting. But Jane, thank you for being here, supporting the Polar Initiative, but also supporting this subject. Thank you very much. The issue of protecting polar ocean spaces uh, seems to me to be a compelling one for not just the Woodrow Wilson Center to address, but in fact all of us who are engaged in, in any issue related to um, designs on frameworks and governance, not only in the polar regions but elsewhere. And the idea of ocean spaces uh, seems to ring true across a lot of the issues that we in the polar regions work with. Obviously the Arctic Ocean and its geography, the Antarctic and its geography, so I'm very pleased that we're able to have this discussion today. So I'd like to put this in a little bit of context. The first issue we'll hear about uh, is the international agreement where nine nations and the EU came together to prevent unregulated fishing in the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean. And that, was, that occurred just at the end of 2017 after many years of, of discussions and uh, I'm sure many debates. 2017 also saw the entry into force of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area in Antarctica, and that included 24 nations and the EU. And so as the Wilson Center celebrates its 50th anniversary, it was <coughs> 1968 that we were created to honor President Woodrow Wilson, <coughs> it's interesting to make the links between uh, the issues we're going to talk about today and what Congress had in mind when this center was founded. Just yesterday, the uh, Vice President for External Affairs, Linda Roth, showed me the document, the narrative, uh, on the creation of the w w Wilson Center. And there were two pillars, two filters, that Congress and the advisory uh, committee that f helped form the center uh, put forward as a challenge for the scholars that would then come to work at the center, a filter for us to think through our work in the coming years. And I'll take two quotes out of them. The first pillar says this, quote, we should take particular interest in, quote, the development of international law for ocean spaces 50 years ago. We like that. You can even woohoo like you did in the front row. The second <laughs> pillar says the center's scholars should also take a look at contemporary man and his deteriorating environment with special attention to new forms of international cooperation needed to address certain widespread environmental problems. I learned of that 48 hours ago. Mm -hmm. So it is certainly fitting that work has been done over five decades at the center on those issues, but certainly through the Polar Initiative, we've looked to focus on these particular areas, and that's why I'm so pleased that our two colleagues here are with us today, especially after the many decades of service that they have given to, to not just the U.S., but also to colleagues around uh, the Circumpolar North and in the Antarctic. So we have two speakers today. The way this will work first is uh, our speakers will each give about a 15-minute presentation. And then I want to take the majority of time for discussion, questions from the audience. Uh, that's been requested after every one of these presentations. So we're going to try to do that. So about 15 minutes apiece, and then uh, I would encourage you to uh, line up questions or raise issues that we can respond to. So uh, the first speaker, obviously, is Ambassador David Bolton, who just retired. Uh, as Ambassador and former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries, Bureau of Oceans and Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. I am very happy to say that Dave will join us here at the w Wilson Center as a Global Fellow. I think that's not only good for the Wilson Center, but it's good for the polar community as well. And Mr. Evan Bloom, Director of the Office of Oceans and Polar Affairs, U.S. Department of State. Dave will focus on the Central Arctic Ocean and Evan will focus on the recent agreement on the marine protected area in the Ross Sea. So again, the format is each will give a presentation and then we'll follow up with what I hope will be professional yet informal 
questions and answers and issues that we will raise to further discuss. With that, would you please welcome uh, David Bolton. I should also note that, like everything else, we had a technical problem with the screen behind me, so we have this very large, yet small, <laughs> screen here to my left, your right, uh, for the PowerPoint presentations, and we apologize for that. Thanks very much, Mike. I also want to uh, thank President Harmon of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Jane, you're now one of two Janes in my life. The other one's sitting a few rows in front of you. My wife, Jane, thanks also for, for being here. Uh, so as Mike said, I will talk about the new agreement for uh, the Central Arctic Ocean dealing with fisheries. Uh, this is, the idea for this agreement actually started about a decade ago. Uh, I can tell you from my former life uh, working for the U.S. government that there were discussions between the U.S. and Russia, U.S. and Canada as early as 2008 about the need for such an agreement. And indeed, <laughs> I've been giving presentations about this agreement in the works uh, for quite some time, so it's not really new, and yet, what is new? Well, uh, for those of you who uh, read the press accounts, which I must say were pretty accurate, uh, in late November, as Mike said, nine nations in the European Union came together. They reached agreement on the text of a new international agreement, a binding agreement that will prevent unregulated fishing from starting in the uh, high seas area of the Arctic. This is an area about the size of the Mediterranean Sea. In my presentation today, I hope to explain why we need this agreement, some of the process that led to the um, uh, agreement that was reached in November. I will outline for you at least the basic elements of the agreement. And then I need to tell you that it's not in force yet. There are still a number of steps that need to be taken before the agreement enters into force, I'll outline them as well. So um, I assume most of the crowd, both here and online, has a sense of the geography of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, for those who might not, uh, there is a red line that you see, I'm not sure I can focus on that from here, but in the slide you'll see a red line. That is the 200 mile line, the, mile, uh, the line that is uh, rep it represents the furthest extent of fisheries jurisdiction of the nations that surround this pocket in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, a kind of donut hole. Uh, inside the 200-mile uh, coastline, whoops, that was not me, um, each nation has exclusive jurisdiction over fishing, but in the high seas area, the pocket in the middle, the only way to manage fishing properly, or really at all, is through international agreement. When it comes to fisheries, the Arctic is not really a single region. Here you see um, a slide on the slide a map of the Northeast Atlantic as it extends into the Arctic. There are a lot of fisheries going on in this area right now. Some of the world's uh, most productive um, and I would say best managed fisheries are actually in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, the orange shaded areas, including another one that you <coughs> can see at the very top, are part of um, the area managed by international agreement, an agreement that created the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission. There's another um, fisheries organization in the Barents Sea that the um, Norwegians and Russians also manage collectively. And on the other side of the Arctic, the side closest to Alaska and the far eastern part of Russia, it's a very different story. Here, north of the Bering Strait, there are basically no commercial fisheries going on at this time, very, very limited, small scale, uh, within 200 miles of uh, the Russian and U.S. coastlines up there. And in that high seas pocket, here you see another depiction of it, there has never been in recorded history any record of commercial fishing, never. Why? Well, it has been ice-covered year-round until now. As we all know, the Arctic is melting. Here you see two depictions of this. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you see a chart of the minimum sea ice extent. Uh, it almost always occurs in September of each year, and the chart runs from the late 70s till I think, just last year, and you can definitely see the trend line. And one of the most dramatic depictions of it 
uh, at least in a still slide, you'll see uh, in the lower left-hand corner the sea ice extents in 1984 and 2012 were particularly low, low year. Um, and what this means is that a portion of that high seas area is now ice-free for at least part of the year for the first time in recorded history. In the United States, since roughly 2010, we have prohibited commercial fishing in the shaded area on this slide. This is the area of the U.S. exclusive economic zone north of Alaska. Why did we do this? We did this because we don't have enough information, scientific information, with which to manage fishing in this area properly. I don't know that this is a permanent state of affairs, but it has been put in place and shows, shows no sign of changing. Of course, we only manage, we only have authority to manage out to the 200-mile line at the northern edge of that Arctic management area. And what the United States was most worried about was that vessels from other countries would come and start fishing at mile 201 without any type of control. And indeed, with this slide, uh, thanks to our friends from Pew, you'll see the area of um, uh, open water, it used to be frozen, and also some areas that are among the shallow areas here, probably, probably, uh, most likely places where fishing could start. And some of them are actually just at mile 201, beyond the EEZs of the United States and the Russian Federation. And so, we started talking not only to Russia, but also to Canada, Norway, and uh, Denmark, um, thanks to Greenland, about the need for this type of agreement. Our thought was, let us first get the five nations whose EEZs surround, or fishing, fishing zones surround this area, to agree in principle on what ought to be done before reaching out to others, and we succeeded. After a number of rounds of negotiations, um, we produced something called the Oslo Declaration that was non-binding. It was signed by those five states in 2015. You can see in the lower picture uh, five proud people signing who have uh, received their signed copies of the Oslo Declaration. The picture in the upper corner is the last round of negotiations that took place uh, to produce this declaration. And the, this statement said, these five nations will not allow their own commercial vessel vessels to fish in this high seas area until there is enough science and until there is a subsequent agreement to manage, actually manage the fisheries based on that science. They committed in principle to start a joint program of scientific research in order to develop the scientific knowledge with which to manage any fishing in that area. But they also recognized that they could not solve this problem by themselves. Vessels from other countries in principle are allowed to send, um, I'm sorry, other countries allowed to send their vessels to fish in high seas areas, including in the Arctic. So it was necessary to reach out to some others if this agreement was to be real. And that's what we did. That's an actual picture of the negotiations. <laughs> There were six rounds of negotiations, um, and it wasn't obvious at first that we would succeed. Indeed, a number of the negotiating delegations did not agree that there needed to be a binding agreement, and the terms of that agreement were not at all um, in focus, I would say, for the first, well, really for all six rounds until the very end. But there you see, uh, which in addition to those first five, the ones that signed the Oslo Declaration, we now have <coughs> People's Republic of China, Japan, Republic of Korea, um, Iceland, and the European Union, the so-called five plus five format. Five rounds of negotiation, three of which took place here in Washington, D.C., including most recently in November of 2017. We weren't actually operating, I should say, in a vacuum. Civil society was um, very much a part of this. We had support from uh, Arctic indigenous peoples. Several delegations had Arctic indigenous peoples represented on their delegations, including the United States. Uh, a number of um, environmental organizations were seized of this issue. Uh, State of Alaska, the U.S. fishing industry, also in support, and uh, the scientific community. This is uh, an excerpt of one such letter 
uh, an open letter we received from scientists around the world, um, not the first, I might, might add. And they say, we write now to urge these states and the EU to conclude a successful agreement demonstrating the commitment to sound stewardship of the Arctic Ocean and peaceful international cooperation. Nice. So, in November, at the close of the sixth round of negotiations, we reached agreement on a text. And here are its basic elements. It's actually pretty simple. One, these 10 agree not to allow their vessels to fish in this high seas area, conduct commercial fishing in this high seas area that is unregulated. Now, there is 7% of this area that is within the competence of one of these, uh, one of the regional fishery management organizations I mentioned earlier. There's never been any fishing in that portion. If NEAFC were to regulate that fishing, it would be permissible under the new agreement. But for the 93% of the high seas area not covered by an existing uh, fishing agreement, there can be no commercial fishing under this agreement. Two, these 10 have now agreed to pool their resources and establish a joint program of scientific research. It's actually called scientific research <coughs> and monitoring. The idea being we need more data. We need more information about this area. We need to know the status of the stocks that people might want to fish. We need to know their relationships with other living marine organisms. And we need to know about the ecosystem even more broadly. That will get launched. Another major element, uh, these parties will meet every two years at least, could meet more often. How will they make decisions? All 10 need to agree, consensus decision making. And the last and possibly the most important aspect of this, this, is <coughs> this agreement is regarded not as permanent but as temporary. The idea is there will someday likely be commercial fishing in this area. We will need to move from the agreement we have come, uh, come to now to some future agreement. This is part of a stepwise process. That's the phrase that uh, was bandied about a lot around the negotiating table. And so at some point, this agreement will lapse and presumably a new agreement will replace it. When will that happen? Well. This agreement has a duration of at least 16 years. However, the parties could, even before we reach that 16-year period, decide to replace it with a different kind of agreement. Or at the 16-year mark, they could decide to extend the agreement in five-year increments. We'll have to wait and see what unfolds. Those are the basic elements of the new agreement. And now, the next steps. As I said, we're not quite home yet. What we have is agreement on a text, but it needs to be subjected to uh, what the French call la toilette, a legal and technical review. Uh, this is not a substantive negotiation. We're just making sure the cross-references are accurate, the um, format and uh, punctuation and all sorts of other good stuff is actually all perfect. And then um, the agreement will be open for signature. My guess is it will be signed. Um, sometime within the next six months, I'm just guessing. It will, in order to be signed, first have to be translated in a number into a number of other languages. And all 10 delegations will need to seek and obtain authority to have the agreement signed. I am confident that they will, but it still is a process that we need to go through. And for some, the agreement may need to be submitted to parliaments. We don't know yet, actually, whether we will need to send it to the Senate for advice and consent. This decision still to be made. Uh, but in any event, once all 10 have completed their internal procedures, then and only then will the agreement actually enter into force, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. And when it does, it will join three other binding agreements that have been reached in recent years relating to the Arctic region we are building, in a sort of um, fits and starts way, uh, a new architecture for, for the Arctic, and in particular here for the Arctic Ocean, or at least a part of it. Uh, and it also demonstrates 
at least to me, that countries that may not always agree on other things can nevertheless come together when they have mutual interests and come together and, and reach agreement on something important, including this. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. And of course, our next spe speaker is uh, Evan Bloom, and Evan will focus on the marine protected area in um, the Ross Sea of the Antarctic. Well, thank you uh, very much. I'd like to thank the Wilson Center. Mike, thanks for uh, inviting me. And um, uh, it, it's a particular uh, pleasure to be here this afternoon, uh, to be here with my friend and me mentor, Dave Bolton. Um, it was his retirement party uh, ceremony uh, at the State Department last week, and I was supposed to be one of the speakers there, and I then wasn't able to make it. So I have about 20 minutes of material ready to use <laughs> about Feel free. Um, his... Uh, really? Feel sure. Okay. Well, that, here we go. Uh, Jane, his wife, uh, you haven't heard all of this, so I'm <laughs> Any event, uh, we can do that later. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to be here. I I'm here because I uh, have been working on this uh, Ross Sea uh, issue for a long time. Um, I'm the U.S. representative to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, uh, henceforth referred to as CAMELAR, and have been the uh, uh, U.S. commissioner there for the last uh, dozen years or so. And uh, working on this particular uh, project, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, for six or seven of those years, uh, which has been a very uh, special time and a particularly gratifying time because of how much we were um, able to, to achieve. And I'm going to talk about um, that here today. Um, that wasn't the right button. That wasn't the right button. The arrow key. The ah, that is the right button. Thank you. Any event, so, um, I, so what I want to talk about is um, this uh, important development in uh, polar diplomacy, um, a key development in marine conservation, um, and of course in Antarctic diplomacy as well. Um, this was the establishment of the world's largest marine protected area and the first large scale MPA on the high seas. Um, this was a U.S. and New Zealand uh, joint proposal, first two separate proposals and then uh, put together jointly. Um, but even before we brought them together, we had worked a great deal with, with the, the Kiwis on this. And um, on the U.S. side, we had a really uh, deep and involved interagency team from uh, State Department and NOAA and National Science Foundation. Uh, the chief scientist uh, who was sort of the brainchild of this proposal as a NOAA scientist, George Waters, who uh, is at the Southwest Fisheries Center for, for NOAA in, in La Jolla. And so this was a major effort by scientists, by diplomats at all levels, and by uh, non-governmental uh, actors as well, some of whom are, are here with us uh, today. So this is the map of the Camelar. And the, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, it encompasses the waters surrounding the Antarctic uh, continent, but not only the area south of 60 degrees south latitude, which is the area of the Antarctic Treaty, but uh, an area that goes somewhat north of that that covers uh, more or less the area of the Antarctic Convergence, where you would find uh, fish and other marine mammals that are of interest to this body. Um, there are 25 members, uh, 24 countries, plus the European Union. It operates on the basis of consensus, and therefore you, uh, it's a particular challenge to bring, uh, you have to bring all of the members on board in order to get anything done. Um, it's part of the Antarctic Treaty System, so it's kind of the bookend to the, the other body is the a Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting that also meets once a year. And Camelar is known for the quality of its science and of the quality of its scientists and for paying attention to what uh, the scientists are, are recommending. And uh, so we put together uh, this uh, proposal um, because the Ross Sea is a unique uh, area in the globe um, with high biodiversity, 
Um, it has a diverse ecosystem uh, with an intact community of high-level predators, whales, seals, penguins, um, a lot of areas that are of scientific uh, interest and, and generally thought to be worth protecting. So um, what had, part of what had to be negotiated here were uh, a series of protection objectives, and that includes protecting representative benthic and pelagic bioregions, uh, core distributions of key prey species and foraging areas, uh, coastal locations of ecological importance, et cetera, and a focus in particular on toothfish, which as uh, you may know are what you find on the menu here is Chilean sea bass. Um, also science objectives, uh, to, compare areas to uh, compare areas to learn ecosystem effects of fishing and climate change, uh, help with stock assessments for uh, toothfish, and to understand, for example, more about krill in the ecosystem. Now, th one thing about this MPA is it, it's, it's quite large. Um, it's somewhere between the size of Saudi Arabia or Mexico, 2.06 million square kilometers, and that's if you include the Ross Ice Shelf area. It's still 1.5 uh, million square kilometers if you just include the currently available sea area, um, and that's twice the size of Texas. So this area would be the, th uh, the size of the 13th largest country on the planet uh, if, you, uh, if you looked at it in that way. And so uh, what we negotiated were three zones. The one that's marked A, which you probably can't see very well here, um, is no-take area. It's about three-quarters um, of the, the space. Uh, so commercial fishing is prohibited uh, in that area, and then a, a krill research zone and a special research zone as well. So what we put together, um, first uh, was it 10 years of scientific work, six years of diplomatic work at this commission, um, was uh, a rather complex document um, that describes all the aspects of how you run a marine protected area. Um, having to work out issues such as the, the scientific basis for the various boundaries, uh, the duration, issues related to reporting, uh, redistribution of fishing effort outside the MPA, we need to develop a management plan. So there are a lot of um, interlocking and working pieces that came with all of this. And there were numerous drafts and revisions that took place over the um, six years of negotiation. By the time we reached uh, early 2015, we had all but two countries, China and Russia. And so in 2015, we had a special push of trying to convince the Chinese uh, about all of this. And a uh, quick story if I, I have the time. Um, so Dave and I went off to Beijing and had discussions with the Ch Chinese. They uh, who were certainly not on board with this, uh, the, what we were trying to do. And we left uh, Beijing without having reached agreement. And uh, we get back off the plane, we get on the dullest people mover things that you've all been on, we take out our Blackberries. And I, Dave says, have you seen this? And we come over, we sort of look at what was going on. Um, when we left, before we left Beijing, we sent a report, as we, you know, supposed to do, we're diplomats, we do that sort of thing, sent a report back to Washington saying, this is what happened. Well, uh, that report was taken to the White House, and on that, that very day, President Obama was meeting with President Xi. And President Obama said, apparently, this is interesting, and walked it into pr uh, President Xi and said, you know, we really ought to do something about this Ross Sea thing. And so that was the report we got at Dulles. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a result. I, I, I'm not aware that President Xi said, yes, we agree, or anything like that. Um, doesn't uh, happen quite that easily. But by the time we got to Camelar in October of 2015, after a, a certain amount of discussion, it turned out that the Chinese were ready to come on board. And, uh, and we worked that out with them. Then we have one country left and that's the Russian Federation. 
Now, Russia at this point is the chair of the commission and has a lot of authority when it comes to how the commission works at that point. And we had a very, very good uh, chairman, uh, now the acting head of the legal uh, office at the Russian Foreign Ministry, and worked closely with him. Uh, our Secretary of State uh, had been talking to his counterpart, uh, Foreign Secretary Lavrov, um, and as I understand it, the, the issue was presented to uh, President Putin during uh, this, the time of the meeting, and something happened within uh, the Russian government, and we finally had a road forward with Russia as well. And as I said, you need a consensus at Kamalar, and all of a sudden there was work to do and details to work out, but we had an agreement. And so it was a, a very uh, exciting moment for us. So uh, what is the significance of, of, of what I've been describing? This is the first uh, large-scale high seas uh, MPA and the world's largest. So it's kind of a breakthrough event in that respect. It's, it safeguards a huge unspoiled area of, of the planet and sets it aside for future generations and, and for scientific work. And it stands as proof that large-scale MPAs can in fa fact be done by international organizations and uh, international uh, negotiating efforts. It also showed uh, that you can have collaboration, meaningful collaboration in a, mar a mar maritime con uh, context between fishing and non-fishing uh, nations. Um, and it's also a particular spur to science and marine science uh, in, in particular. Um, and it's a precedent for future work that's going on not, not just within uh, Antarctica, uh, but also in terms of broader marine negotiations that are going on now, including um, at the UN and something called BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which is the big high seas treaty negotiation focus that's going on, going on right now. So this is an important precedent that relates to, to that work as well. So um, I, I'd say, finally, um, this was a particularly gratifying uh, moment for me to see all of this come together. When we arrived at the end of 2016 in, um, uh, in Hobart, which is where the commission meets, we didn't know that we were going to have agreement. Um, and after very hard negotiations after all of these years to have it come together uh, was, was very special. Um, it, uh, the agreement called for entry into force of this, uh, uh, of this MPA a year later. So this entered into force only a, a few weeks ago um, and will run for at least 35 years. Um, and at that point, Thank goodness uh, I will not be U.S. representative <laughs> at Camelar, and others can figure out uh, how it will move forward at that point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. <laughs> Thanks to you both for uh, excellent presentations, and I just think it reinforces the fact that if many of us are looking at the Arctic, you just cannot ignore the Antarctic. Lots of overlapping themes and implications uh, and similar frameworks, even though there might be you know, dissimilar dynamics in, in the two regions, there is far more overlap and, and interest in, in both as opposed to one or the other. So thank you very much for that. At this time, I very much would like to engage this audience in questions, answers, themes, issues, and, and make this more of an open dialogue, a relaxed uh, forum for us to have discussions on these two very important frameworks. So we have a microphone. Thank you to uh, my associate, Jack Durkee, who has darn near single-handedly pulled off every event that I've decided we will do. So thank you, Jack. Uh, but please, I encourage you to, to ask a question or, or raise an issue. Hello, I'm John Baker. Uh, I had a question. I'm a non-expert, but I'm hoping you can help me with it. In terms of these migratory uh, fish stocks, how does that complicate what you're trying to do in both cases? And are that is that a challenge or an issue in both 
the polar areas. I can start. Uh, you're you're certainly right that um, fish tend not to abide by the lines that people draw in the ocean. Um, with respect to the Arctic, we don't really know what's up there in any serious way yet. It's been so hard and there has been so little attention paid to fisheries science in that area. I can't <coughs> the extent of the um, the extent to which fish that occur inside 200 miles of coastal zones will also occur in the high sea. <coughs> there is a general concept in international law, however, that if a stock straddles that 200 mile line, the management of the stock inside and outside needs to be compatible. And that is something that is also built into the new Arctic fisheries agreement. Whatever is done for a particular stock on the in the high seas area needs to be compatible with what's going on inside the zone so that the stock is managed as a whole. So, so for uh, the Southern Ocean, um, I, I could just add that um, CAMELAR, this organization, controls the entire uh, area that was uh, relevant to the, to the subject matter. So uh, fish going in and out of the convention area wasn't really an issue for us. But of course, when you draw these boundaries, um, the, the, the fish don't know where those boundaries are. And if a fish were smart enough to stay in the MPA, that would be better for its health than if it you know, goes outside the MPA and, and can get caught. Um, but, but that aside, um, part of what we were dealing with was um, knowing where the concentration of uh, not only the fish were, but where fishing was taking place. And what was controversial about what we were talking about is to take areas that actually had been fished and making them no-take no areas. That's one of the hardest things to do in any sort of fishing diplomacy. And so um, there, were, there are certainly areas which we left alone because they were su of such importance to a number of industries that um, fishing had to continue in that area. And some of the NGOs, for example, had wanted to take the entire Ross Sea and put it off limits from fishing. But that was never going to be politically feasible. So we had to come up with some other ideas, uh, which we still think had a lot of uh, value from a, from a scientific point of view. Thank you. Next question. Here on my, my left, you're right, Jack. Thank you. Joel Coulter for Honeycomb Networks. You mentioned consensus uh, decision making. I know how long it's taken us to try to get tribes who are under consensus decision. You know, all the tribal council members have to agree. In our own country, it takes years. Is there any thought to how NOAA, with their geo common operations picture, could help share environmental situational awareness data to help build consensus quicker? What would y'all like to see to improve in collaboration to build consensus? So uh, that's a good question. As a general matter, for the Arctic and for this Arctic Fisheries Agreement in particular, though, um, the question seems to assume that if everyone had the same scientific information, they would absolutely agree on what is the right thing to do about it. That may be overstating the case. The biggest decision these 10 uh, will need to make in the future is when and how will we move or will they move as a group from this agreement to the next agreement. And that is not a scientific decision exactly. Um, consensus is not easy to achieve, you're right. Here at least there are only 10, and my experience in other international forests suggests that it's a small enough group that my hope is that they will come together as they did actually through the negotiating process, and that can make the important decisions in a timely and reasonable way. Well, it's, it's a somewhat different context uh, f uh, because there are no um, indigenous uh, uh, political elements for uh, um, Antarctica, but you have different countries which either at the Antarctic Treaty or in Camelar all have to come together. So um, you have to um, focus on the, the politics and the economics and bring the best information you can to the table. 
Um, and that's why uh, having scientists in the league talking about why the MPA is important and why it should have certain rules and boundaries is, is key. Because I think that that's the, the way to convince uh, other countries. It's like you have a very strong scientific rationale and certainly what NOAA brings to the table on that is, is absolutely, uh, has been absolutely critical. Next question. Hang on, we're, we're gonna bring a microphone around to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Anita here in the front. Thank you very much, and thank you for remarkable presentations. Um, my name is Anita Parlo, and I was the team lead for the um, Polar Code Round Table, which was uh, U.S., uh, Russia, Canada, and the Bering, uh, which was in a teensy way the predecessor to this remarkable program you're all doing. So I have a couple of quick questions, if I may. One is I wonder, uh, for purposes of monitoring uh, enforcement and regulatory processes, how, how will that unfold? And uh, second, in terms of entry into force, uh, generally speaking, what, what is the dynamic and time frame? And what about U.S.? How does that look? And uh, in terms of uh, Central Arctic Ocean and international waters, um, so China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, EU have been added in to the coast of states. And how is that going to work? I guess you were talking about consensus to some degree, but is it going to become like a little UN or, you know, what's the dynamic that will unfold? Thank you. Thank you. So maybe we'll go with the first one, issues are related to monitoring. Is that be the easiest approach? Um, yeah, although it's uh, no easy feat to monitor what's going on in the high seas area of the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, fortunately, for at least 16 years following its entry into force, the rule is basically no fishing. Um, and it is at least possible, right, uh, to detect um, from satellites whether vessels are in a place they shouldn't be. But even that is a little more complicated in that there, this, ag this agreement, this uh, one that we hope will enter into force soon, does allow for trial or exploratory fishing um, and how to make sure that is not abused and turned into commercial fishing um, is uh, going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. So ensuring that there was monitoring in uh, the Southern Ocean to, to support the, these regulations was always a, a concern, including for, from countries that said, well, since monitoring is difficult, is it really a good idea to do this because some will cheat and then there will be fish taken and then you don't have the, the, the benefits uh, that, that, that you, you think you're going to have if, if you can't do that. But um, a lot of attention it has, been played, uh, has been put into monitoring the technical means for doing that um, and the cooperation among states. One, one thing to uh, recognize for Camelar is now that this MPA has been established, it is a, an MPA of all of Camelar. So all of the countries that are active in Antarctica are, uh, are parties to this and are obligated to do everything they can to promote enforcement inside and outside the MPA. So it's not easy at all, but it is something that, um, that uh, countries, all 25 members, uh, have said they're going to do. And th this issue of entry into, f into force? Uh, I touched on it briefly. All 10 of those uh, who negotiated the Arctic Fisheries Agreement need to sign it and complete their internal approval procedures. Um, that could take up to two years, uh, especially if some of the countries need to send it to their parliaments for approval. Um, so my guess is signature this year, entry into force, maybe next. And for the Ross Sea MPA, it's now in force. It will be in force for at least 35 years. And no, it would take uh, a consensus decision to undo it. Um, I its provisions are reviewed every five years or so. Um, so it could be changed if the parties wished. Um, but now it's, it's fully operational. And just to follow up, why 35 years? So, um, our original uh, position and, and that of many other countries is that we wanted the MPA to be to continue indefinitely. 
um, in order to um, promote its, uh, the, the reason for its uh, being uh, put into place to promote the science and environmental protection, et cetera. Um, but this is a political process, and not every country uh, supported the idea of, of uh, perpetuity. Uh, some suggested five years, some suggested ten, um, and there was a long political process that resulted in um, the agreement of um, 35. At the last moment, it went from 30 to 35, and that's where it, it stayed. Thank you. And Dave, just finally, the, the other issue Anita raised of the sort of um, smaller UN model uh, in the CIO, do you want to address that? So for those of you who uh, know about the Arctic, stop thinking about this as an Arctic agreement, particularly it's a fisheries agreement. And anybody who knows about fisheries agreements, in order to be successful, you need to have all of those who are either the coastal states or the high seas fishing states, in this case potential high seas fishing states, to reach agreement together. And that's what this is. China, Japan, Korea, the EU, perhaps Iceland, uh, even though they don't have um, fishery zones bordering this area, uh, certainly at least the first four of them have the capacity to fish in this area. And if they didn't, if they weren't part of the group, um, uh, this agreement could not be effective. So it's not a UN, but it is a sort of precursor to what may someday be a regional fishery management organization. That would be a better way of thinking about this agreement. Great. Thank you. Other questions? In the middle? Thank you very much. Michael Zwern, former Wilson employee and uh, currently at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. I'm curious, um, with Russia such an important player in both the Antarctic and the Arctic regions, how has the uh, ever-changing nature of the relationship between the United States and Russia had an impact on the status of the negotiations, particularly the Ross Sea negotiation where Russia was a stumbling block for so long? W one thing I've uh, found in working in both the Arctic and the Antarctic is that the polar regions can sometimes be an, ex an exception and an area where uh, ultimately uh, you can do things cooperatively that might be difficult at various points in, in, uh, in, in other places. Um, for, the, for Antarctica, the Russians have uh, been uh, there for a long time. They have had uh, strong fishing interests, um, and they've had a very strong presence. But the U.S. and Russia have a long history of working together in, on Antarctic issues. Indeed, we had a joint inspection of foreign uh, Antarctic uh, uh, facilities with the Russians in 2012, um, and our, the U.S. Antarctic program and the Russian uh, uh, program have always had very strong links. Um, here, given the longstanding Russian um, fishing history, there were some interests there that really did have to be managed and focused on. And yet there was always in the background, despite things going on in other parts of the world, I think the ability to talk directly about cooperation in Antarctica. And uh, I think that's mirrored uh, a bit in what you see in the Arctic and in the cooperation we have with the Russians in the Arctic Council. Um, it doesn't mean, especially when it gets into economic issues, that, that things are easy to, to deal with. But I think there was a base layer of, of people knowing each other, diplomats knowing each other, that um, made it easier to find a, a way forward. Dave? Um, I agree. My experience in dealing with uh, friends from Russia, and I want to acknowledge a couple of them here in the audience from the Russian Embassy now, was that the, the problems, the frictions between the United States and Russia relating to other parts of the world or other issues did not matter in the negotiation of this particular, um, this particular agreement. Russia had its fisheries interests and some Arctic interests that needed to be accommodated the way every other player did. Um, but we were dealing with each other um, uh, on the merits, as it were, of the agreement, in, of this agreement in particular, and not worrying about Syria or Ukraine or uh, any other points of tension in the relationship. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, in the back, Jack. 
that was factual, not a rhyme. Or, yeah, thank you. Scott Hay, Ghost, <coughs> an Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition board member. Great presentation, Dave and Evan. Uh, speaking of something common to the Arctic and the Antarctic, I wonder if either or both of you would comment on key issues you see in taking the IMO, International Maritime Organization, Polar Code forward. Thank you. David? Uh, okay. So um, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, through the International Maritime Organization, there was agreed um, more than a year ago now uh, a new code, a polar code relating to shipping in the, in the two polar regions. And it uh, only became effective, I think, the beginning of last year. Is that right, Evan? Right. Um, so it is being implemented now. And there are certain aspects of it that need still to be um, worked on a bit more. Uh, certainly from the environmental community, uh, one thing that uh, we hear a lot about is a restriction or perhaps even a ban on the use of heavy fuel oil by ships in the Arctic. This was something that was agreed to for the Antarctic region and has been in effect for some time, but it's not yet in effect in the Arctic. Uh, the ban would, at least as proposed, would relate to both the carriage of this type of oil on ships um, and that, as well as the use of it in their engines. But the carriage of this type of fuel uh, on board uh, is not the easiest issue to solve because there are a lot of communities in um, the Arctic that depend on this to run their, their, this type of fuel to run their generators and the like. And if they no longer could receive these shipments by ship, that would be a problem. So um, the question may come down to a phasing out of heavy fuel oil in favor of uh, cleaner uh, substitutes. Uh, that may take some time to reach agreement. Uh, but that is one area where I think the polar code may get strengthened, at least as it relates to the Arctic region. Uh, S Scott, thanks for your uh, question. Um, beyond the HFO issue that, that Dave referred to, um, there is this uh, key question related to coverage of fishing vessels, which would be um, related to any phase two of the, of, of the negotiations. So there's a fair amount of work still to be done. And those of us who work in the Southern Ocean appreciate the fact uh, that there have been a lot of fishing vessel casualties um, in the past uh, 10, 20 years, um, and that a strength in polar code uh, would very much help uh, in terms of uh, safety. Uh, and so um, uh, there, are a lot there are a lot of reasons that, that um, it's been difficult to make progress in that area, but hopefully the phase two will uh, um, have more to say when it comes to these so-called non-SOLAS vessels. Next question. Here in the front. Hi, uh, Jerry Leap with the Pew Charitable Trust. Thanks, Dave and Evan, for your excellent presentations, and also for the leadership you both have per displayed for to it in these significant achievements. They really are sort of remarkable things, and glad we're noting them in this present in this uh, briefing today. Wanted to talk to you, raise the issue of climate change. We, you know, this is, as we all know, is being most intensely felt in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And we, you both touched on the joint scientific programs that are critical parts of both these new agreements. And I was wondering two things. One, the role, um, how climate change is going to be dealt with or addressed within this, these monitoring programs. And what, if at all, you believe it can contribute this sort of joint scientific monitoring I mean, especially in light of this current administration, at least from some of our perspectives, isn't as thrilled about working on climate change as um, previous ones. Thank you. Thank you. Evan, can I pose upon you to, to start that? Um, sure. Um, w one of the key reasons we talked about um, in, in terms of wanting to have this a MPA was to promote science, including climate science. Um, and that continues. The scientists I work with at NOAA and other places um, see the Rossi MPA as a, 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 an excellent opportunity for doing the kind of long-scale studies that are, can only be done in areas that are relatively pristine and remote. 
and you need large no-take areas if you're going to do that in a, in a marine uh, context. So um, I know that uh, scientific colleagues uh, have every intention to continue with that. Um, and it's part of it is uh, U.S., but again, as I was saying before, this is now a Camel RNPA. It's not just an area for the U.S. and New Zealand to be uh, focusing on. It's uh, of the entire world scientific community can now um, do climate-related work um, in, in this rather huge area. And there are specific ideas uh, from within the scientific community how to take that uh, forward, and that includes the kind of uh, long-scale monitoring that uh, I think you were referring to. Uh, Jerry, let me start by thanking you and Pew more generally for all the support that you have lent to both of these initiatives. Uh, arguably, they would not have happened but for that type of support from uh, your organization and others uh, who cared about this. Um, so thank you for that. Um, for the Arctic Fisheries Agreement, I would say that climate change was the cause of it. We wouldn't have had an agreement or the need for such an agreement but for the fact that the ice is melting, right? Uh, but the scientific program that will be pursued through this agreement is not focused exactly on climate. The questions to be that, that, that will be addressed are, are the fish moving north? And if so, how much, what species, and how do they relate to one another? And what does the ecosystem, the changing e ecosystem as a whole, look like? Of course, that depends a lot on climate science, and probably things will get learned in the process. But what we're trying to figure out is, can a f commercial fishery in this area be initiated sustainably? And I don't know that there's an answer to that question yet. We have about 10 to 15 minutes left, so let me encourage you to continue to ask questions up here in the front. Thank you, Jack. Thanks. Uh, Dan Hubble from the Environmental Investigation Agency. Uh, and I guess this question is uh, primarily directed at Dave and also touching a little bit on some of the ASOC uh, comments that were directed earlier. Uh, so you had mentioned that this was going to be one of the research focuses of this new agreement was going to include where the fish were going. Yeah. Um, will this also include, say, where animals that eat the fish, like marine mammals, are going? Uh, in the context of polar code, of course, uh, hitting a bowhead whale is, of course, not, it, not just a, a hazard for the whale, but potentially even a safety hazard for uh, the mariners themselves? Uh, the short answer is yes. The, the scientific research program to be established will be looking at the marine ecosystem as a whole, and not just in the high seas pocket, but in the surrounding area as well. We need to know what that ecosystem, probably plural ecosystems, is really doing, how they are changing in order to have a complete picture for managing a potential fishery. Okay. Next question. Same role, please. Thanks, uh, Joel Clement, former colleague of Joel. these fine gentlemen here. I first of all want to say, before I unceremoniously left civil service, I didn't have a chance to thank you for your work <laughs> and, and congratulations on these agreements. They're, they're both fantastic, and you deserve a great deal of credit for that. And uh, so, uh, and Joel, thank you for your service. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Uh, I guess my question is, is very broad. W looking at the horizon for both of these regions, yeah. what are the one or two in the next 10 years or so? You know, once the dust settles from these agreements, and of course there's enforcement and monitoring and that kind of thing, but what are the emerging issues that a lot of us in this room should be really looking toward and starting to anticipate and, and consider? Okay. okay. Um, Bolton so will go that first. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, that question, at least as it relates to the Arctic region particularly, is what uh, motivated me to come join the Woodrow Wilson Center. I wanted to think about um, governance issues. What are the issues in both polar regions, but I'm particularly interested in the Arctic because I know more about it. Uh, what is changing and what needs to be put in place uh, in order to manage that change effectively. Uh, my feeling, Joel, is that the arrangements, at least for the Arctic, for the time being may be satisfactory or adequate, but probably will not be adequate 10, 20 years from now. The changes coming to the region you know very well are dramatic and they're profound and they're likely to continue accelerating, in my sense. 
Um, and so the way the Arctic Council, the way uh, these various agreements we put together are working or will be working now in the near future may be fine, but I have a hunch we will need something more robust as time goes along, and I'm hoping to spend a little time thinking about that and maybe talking to people in this audience and many others who have opinions about this and see if we can't together figure out what the what the future should hold. Andy? So there are, are a lot of different issues um, related to Antarctica, I'll leave the Arctic uh, part uh, aside, um, that uh, are focused on by the Antarctic Treaty System. Um, the successful work on the Ross CMPA just means that there's more work to do, and there are other proposals for MPAs, including large-scale MPAs, in other parts of the Southern Ocean. Um, how those will work out is something that is very much in the minds of governments and NGOs at this uh, moment, um, and whether there will be a continuing appetite for large-scale MPAs after the Ross Sea, um, I, I think is, uh, is an open question. I, I think, I, I hope the answer is yes. But um, there are a lot of things that still need to happen, both politically and, and otherwise, that I think we'll, we'll, we'll need to see, because some of the other proposals out there that didn't move forward at the last meeting of Camelar, and so we'll have to see where all of that goes. Um, but there are other issues, including uh, uh, issues related to krill management that are very important to the understanding the ecosystem approach in the uh, marine setting. Um, questions related to human impacts in, in Antarctica, uh, including issues related to tourism. Those are likely to, to be discussed at the next meeting of the Antarctic Treaty Parties, which will occur in Buenos Aires in, in May. Um, and uh, so they're just uh, the, the usual set of issues related to Antarctic uh, policy can just uh, continue on, um, even though one particular big MPA was, was established. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. So if you've been thinking about one or two more questions, please now is the time. One in the back, and then back up here front. Back first here, thank you. Hi, uh, Zach Schulman, Coast Guard Arctic Policy Office. Uh, questions for both of you. Um, in the realm of international governance and trying to marshal resources on the U.S. domestic end to try to you know, help enforce the agreements that you negotiate, um, a lot of the questions we get are, what's the requirement and why should we care given all of the other issues that we have in a very resource-constrained environment? Um, the Arctic, yes, is geographically big and climactically, scientifically, culturally important. Um, the, the, the metric that we use is ri you know, risk match, risk analysis of how, where do we allocate resources uh, in the institution and, and talking with other agencies just doesn't usually add up. We're usually somewhere near the bottom. Um, how would you, would you like to see messaging wise, you know, advocate the importance of this agreement, the importance of dedicating resources to these issues, um, not just for you know, US government, for other governments globally? Evan? So um, uh, thanks for your question. Um, uh, so for the um, oper operationalization of the MPA, you don't need a Coast Guard icebreaker. And yet, <laughs> and yet, um, having Coast Guard icebreakers um, is very important to the future of polar diplomacy, uh, also for the future of, of operating uh, U.S. activities in, in Antarctica. So the breakout that's done from McMurdo Station, uh, we need the, well it's now the Polar Star, but in the future other Coast Guard um, uh, icebreakers to be available to, to, to do that because otherwise we can't support our infrastructure. Um, and we shouldn't be relying, I think, uh, on, on others. Uh, we, should, we need to do that uh, ourselves. Um, so uh, I don't expect the Coast Guard to be down doing uh, fisheries monitoring in the, in the Southern Ocean because that's never really been its mission.
but in terms of both Arctic and Antarctic, um, having a Coast Guard presence for search and rescue and having um, an adequate uh, ice-breaking platform, I think, is vital. Similarly, for the Arctic Fisheries Agreement I've described today, I don't think we need Coast Guard to be out there monitoring using uh, uh, icebreakers now. But for the Arctic region more generally, I am hoping to see Coast Guard devote more of its limited resources to that region. I certainly have a lot of um, colleagues uh, who agree with me there. It is a new ocean. It's opening up. Uh, we have some strategic uh, and fundamental interests in the Arctic. We need to have a presence there. Coast Guard, uh, with its, what, 11 different missions, can uh, supply that kind of presence. Uh, it's important to us, not only from a Coast Guard point of view, but from, I'd say, a broader U.S. national interest point of view. And yes, I think there is some strong messaging that uh, can be pulled together to help with that. Thank you. We have one last question up here in the front. Thanks. Hi. Uh, Andrew Friedman. Sorry that the last question comes from Pew again. Um, but uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, I was hoping to come back to uh, to the ideas underpinning one of the earliest questions that we had this afternoon about consensus. Um, consensus is, of course, not only a common thread uh, between the two scenarios you presented, but runs throughout ocean governance generally. Mm -hmm. um, though, Ambassador, you mentioned the very different context in which it arises in the Arctic, where it preserves the status quo, yeah. as opposed to in the Antarctic, where it's a challenge to be overcome uh, in order to achieve progressive management. Um, and so my question for the two of you is, having worked in both of these contexts, does the discrepancy between the two uh, at all change the way you think about the need for consensus um, as we continue to build these ocean governance frameworks, both in the Arctic and, and elsewhere? Yeah, I've certainly thought about that a lot. And uh, <laughs> there are no easy answers. Um, for better or worse, consensus decision making in international for it is, is, is usually um, the rule. There are some exceptions to that rule, as I'm sure you know. Um, and those that operate by some other rule have their own set of problems. <laughs> Typically, if agreements could be reached by something less than all states involved, those states who disagree usually have the opportunity to opt out of those. That creates other problems. And so the consensus decision-making, though it does sadly often drive nations to a lowest common denominator, at least then once reached, sticks at least more readily than it might otherwise. Um, Yes, as you hinted at, you can use consensus in different ways. And part of the trick in international negotiations is to try to get the status quo that you want locked in so that it requires consensus to change it. Of course, others know that game. <coughs> um, but that is why I had a job at the State Department, why Evan still has a job at the State Department, trying to <laughs> play that game effectively. Um, in the Arctic, at least, uh, there are a small enough number of players, generally speaking, with similar enough interests, that consensus has not been a huge problem for, say, the Arctic Council. Here in this agreement, where you had five coastal states and five potential distant water fishing states, um, it was a little harder to find consensus, and yet, and yet we did. So you ask a, a, a very interesting question. Uh, question and one that is often raised when we look at either, for example, the operation of the Arctic Council or the Antarctic Treaty or uh, CAMOR. And um, as I mentioned before, when we went into the uh, meeting in Hobart in uh, 2016, we didn't know when we arrived that the Russians would, we, that we're ultimately going to be able to find a way forward. In fact, um, we weren't. Uh, you know, predicting the, any sort of success. And uh, up at that point and in the prior year, there were a lot of people saying, look, this body doesn't function well. We've been trying for so many years to have MPAs, and we simply can't do it. And let's say we had not been successful uh, at the end of 2016, and that continued for a number of years. 
that sentiment, I think, would have grown. And yet, we did have success. And um, once, uh, as Dave suggested, when you have all these countries come together that have uh, s strong interests and they are all able to agree and you're able to do something that is relatively significant, and I would argue that the Rossi MPA is not just some sort of watered down lowest denominator thing, but something that was relatively significant in terms of marine conservation and developing a Antarctic policy, it does have a kind of staying power. Um, so what we saw was, even though it w took years to do, um, it, it worked. And if we had had a different model and some countries had been left out of the process um, may and they would uh, be undercutting the agreement at this point, um, that uh, we'd find ourselves in um, a less positive situation. So um, need to s continue to think about all that. Well, thank you, both of you. We're, we're right on time here. Let me um, ask you to join me in thanking both uh, Evan Bloom and David Bolton for an outstanding presentation. I also want to thank you all for coming out. Please stay tuned. Uh, we, in fact, are a polar initiative, a polar program, so we're looking forward to more work uh, here at the Wilson on the Antarctic. We're very pleased that Ambassador Bolton will be joining us. Evan, we would love for you to come back and work with us on some other initiatives and other presentations. Uh, thank you all again very much, and to my colleagues online still watching. In fact, I have a couple of questions from people I don't know, and I have no idea how they got my cell number, <laughs> but I apologize because they're not identified, but uh, my apologies to them uh, for not getting their questions in uh, on time. Thank you again for coming today. <laughs>